Space junk is becoming a bigger problem than ever, and the reason is because more and more stuff is being sent into space. I'll discuss the space graveyard in another video, but for now, the bigger question I see is, how did this stuff get there? It starts with this. In this video, our aim will be to create a vehicle capable of getting something to a very specific orbit around Earth using basic physics and getting it there with the help of maths. We first need to create a vehicle that can accelerate upwards and escape Earth's gravity, or at the very least, get us into orbit. Essentially, we need some device to push something out one end and thanks to Newton's third law, it will cause the rest of the vehicle to accelerate upwards. This is the core idea behind a rocket. But wait, how will this rocket be designed? Well, we need something at the bottom of the rocket to push it forward. An engine. What will this engine push? Well, it could push highly pressurized gas or other fuels down while the rocket itself moves forward. That sounds like a really good idea, except that we need to design the rocket such that it can withstand such pressures while also being lightweight. See, we want to create as much acceleration as possible, but the more heavy our rocket is, the less acceleration we can generate. This is the essence of Newton's second law, F equals MA. More mass, less acceleration. So we need to build our rocket with a strong yet lightweight material. Titanium and aerospace grade aluminum are both strong metals, yet have low densities, with the densities being lighter than other options like steel. So after months or even years designing and testing rocket designs, you have your very own rocket. Fantastic, but now we need to decide on a fuel. Again, just like with our rocket materials, our fuel should also be lightweight and effective at delivering the required forces to get us into space. Well, here it's important to really delve deep into what exactly we want our rocket to be able to do. So when it launches, we just want it to accelerate as quickly as possible and get it into space. However, for the majority of the time after the launch, we want a fuel that is lightweight, but is also extremely efficient at providing thrust. So why not use a mixture of fuels? More specifically, why don't we use a mixture of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to propel the rocket into space? Not only are both hydrogen gas and oxygen gas extremely lightweight gases, but when they combine together in a chemical reaction, they produce a lot of thrust. In more technical terms, it has a high specific impulse. But unfortunately, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen alone won't work. This is because while liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are extremely efficient at generating thrust when it comes to their respective masses, they don't actually generate a lot of raw thrust when it comes to comparing them to other fuels. So we need another fuel during the initial stages to accelerate us and provide us with a lot of that raw thrust. Well, you could use some form of a solid propellant, which when it reacts and combusts, provides a lot of raw thrust. Solid propellants generally provide lots of thrust, but aren't as efficient as liquid propellants when it comes to how much thrust they produce when in terms of their mass. So we need to develop our rocket such that it has separate sections for this solid propellant, and once this fuel is used up, those sections are then discarded from the rockets. This is the idea behind booster rockets that are applied to the side of the main rocket engine. Great, now you've got a functioning rocket. Now you just need to figure out how much fuel you would need to get a 200 kilogram GPS satellite into space. Once we know that, we then need to decide which orbit to put this 200 kilogram GPS satellite in, and by extension, how fast the rocket needs to go once it reaches that orbit. To figure out a formula that can help us solve all of these problems, Let's go through the following example. So let's say that you've got your rocket and it's ejecting some mass while gravity is acting on the rocket because that's what a rocket does. 
you know that once the rocket reaches a certain height above the Earth, it needs to be at a certain velocity. Velocity is just a fancy word for speed. This velocity we'll figure out later. We can treat the rocket and the fuel ejected as one system, because we know that the momentum of the rocket must cancel out with the momentum of the fuel going in the other direction. The momentum of the fuel that is being ejected from the rocket as the rocket ascends into space. In other words, the net momentum before the rocket ejects a certain amount of fuel, and the net momentum once the rocket ejects that fuel, must be the same. Can you find the relationship between the initial mass of the rocket, the final mass of the rocket, and the initial and final velocities of the rocket as well? Right now, this gravity thing is really getting in the way of the problem. The problem seems to be too complex because of gravity, so let's just assume gravity doesn't exist. I, I know that's a terrible assumption, but we'll just stick with it for now. Let's also pretend that the rocket for some small amount of time, dt, is on its way up into space. During this small time interval, the rocket loses some amount of fuel, which used to be part of the rocket, and this fuel is travelling in the opposite direction of the rocket at some exhaust velocity, which we will label V minus VE. Why? Because the fuel used to go at the same velocity as the rocket, at velocity V, but since that fuel was ejected at a velocity VE, its total or net velocity becomes V minus VE. We'll label the fuel ejected dm, or a tiny change in the mass of the rocket. On the other hand, during this small time interval dt, the rocket has increased its velocity by some small amount dv, while losing dm worth of mass. Recall that the momentum of the rocket fuel system cannot change. In other words, we can state that the momentum before, the mass of the rocket times the velocity of the rocket is equal to the mo momentum of the rocket after minus the momentum of the fuel that is ejected. Once we do some ma mathematical manipulation, we get the following equation. Let's apply this equation across the entire journey of the rocket, in other words from launch to the orbit. One way we could do that is we could actually separate the trajectory into separate time intervals and calculate the before and after momentums that way and get a rough estimate for the amount of fuel that is going to be used. Another more smart way to do this is to use a technique called integration, which is basically the same thing as before, but then seeing what the estimate approaches as we consider smaller and smaller time intervals. Integrating both sides, and then doing some mathematical manipulation, we get the following equation. We just rediscovered the rocket equation. Actually, it's the ideal rocket equation, because we haven't taken into account gravity. But, for the most part, it gives accurate estimates for the amount of fuel required for a particular amount of payload. Okay, great, now we've got this magnificent equation that can calculate for us the amount of fuel required to get our 200 kilogram satellite into space. Based on other research, you know that the fuel escapes the rocket at roughly 3,500 to 4,000 meters per second. That is the exhaust velocity that we were talking about earlier, which we labeled VE. So now it's time to figure out the rest of the problem. And that is, we need to know how far we would like our satellite from Earth. Now, we obviously know that most things orbit in ellipses. The Earth orbits the Sun in an ellipse, so does the rest of the planets, and even the Moon as well. But it's much simpler if we assume that we'd like the satellite to orbit in a perfect circle. So what does that mean? Well, let's zoom into the orbit and see what the satellite is doing at each of these points. Velocity, as I mentioned before, is just a fancy version of speed, where basically you tell how fast the object is going and in what direction. In more technical terms, we can describe the velocity of the satellite as a vector. At this point in the orbit, the velocity vector of the satellite looks like this, and, at, and here it looks like this. 
and in general, the velocity vector is always tangential to the orbit the satellite is going in. But wait, what is the acceleration of that object? Well, what you can do is you can subtract any two nearby velocity vectors and get an estimate for the direction of the acceleration. So we need to position the satellite in such a way, at such a velocity, that it is experiencing this centripetal acceleration on it, keeping it in a circular orbit. After looking at the problem for quite some time, you might realize that you may need some more information. When dealing with problems related to circles, it's best to draw out some of the features of that circle, namely its radius. If we were to draw the change in position between two instances of the satellite in its orbit, then what we get is an isosceles triangle. An isosceles triangle is basically a triangle where two sides have the same length. In this case, the isosceles triangle has two sides of the same length, they are the radius of the circle, and one side has a length which is the change in position the change in position of the satellite in this isosceles triangle is the velocity times some small time interval, delta t. Now, notice that at all points, the velocity vectors of the satellite are perpendicular to the radius of the circle. That's what it means for something to be tangential to a circle. Well, let's rotate both velocity vectors by 90 degrees, such that they are parallel to the radius of the circle. And notice how the angle between the velocity vectors is the same as the angle between the two radius lines shown. That means that our little velocity triangle here, this angle is also theta. That means both our radius triangle with the change in position and our velocity triangle with the change in velocity are similar triangles. And we can use the power of ratios to find a relationship between the two triangles. Let's take these two sides. The ratio between both of these sides in the velocity triangle is the same as the ratio between the lengths of these two sides in the radius triangle. Rearranging, this gives us delta V over delta T is equal to V squared over R. But we know what delta V over delta T is. That is the definition of acceleration. Acceleration is just a measure of the change in velocity over a period of time. So we've just figured out a relationship between the acceleration on a satellite in a circular orbit around Earth and its velocity and the radius that we want that satellite to be orbiting at. What is the force that our satellite is experiencing? Well, it's the mass of the satellite times its acceleration. This is by definition equal to the force of gravitation on the satellite, since the only force that will be acting on the satellite is gravity. So if we do some mathematical rearranging, we get an equation for velocity in terms of the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and the radius that our satellite is orbiting at. This is fantastic! Now we have a formula to determine how fast our satellite needs to go at a particular height above the Earth's surface for it to be in orbit at that radius. Our rocket needs to be somewhere around there to eject the satellite, so for simplicity's sake, we'll need to make sure the rocket makes it to that orbit where we want our satellite to be in. The question now is, how far away from Earth do we want this GPS satellite? Well, we'll need this satellite to be close to the Earth, so why not put it 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth? Well, that's an idea, but the atmosphere is still thick enough there to slow down the satellite over time, and therefore our GPS satellite can't stay there for very long. In fact, most GPS satellites are situated 20,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. Of course, this is a very simplistic version of how aerospace engineers get stuff into space, and it's actually quite a miracle that people have made it there in the first place. However, there's still lots of research and development left to go, because at some point, we will need to get to Mars. In fact, 
we recently are making history with the Artemis 2 mission. To learn more about that, just click the video that you see on your screen.